Now let me talk about <laughs> Victoria talking about efficiency in WeOx research. Uh, Victoria, um, I think of her as an anthropologist. It's not probably true, but um, she's uh, she's done just so much um, thinking uh, and and working in the Kai Kai um, and thinking about new scenarios and interactions with with uh, Kai um, at at um, at uh, Xerox Park. One time she brought me in to do some envisioning about cars of the future. Very interesting conversation. It's incredibly broad uh, experiences with lots and lots of projects, working with lots of different personalities, lots of different organizations um, at Park. Uh, let me just tell you, everyone is as brilliant as they think. Um, and uh, so you, 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 um, you know, maybe you were there, what, 20 years? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 20 years. Yeah, so, so you know, Keeps a smile on her face. <laughs> um, and uh, so we are very excited to have her. And uh, she's going to uh, be talking about this, 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 uh, this paragraph here. But um, I really shouldn't uh, say too much more, uh, except that the, her bio is online. And you'll see that she's worked at a lot of places in the last few years, getting a lot of experience that I hear seems even valuable to you. Thank you for the introduction, Ted. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, Edwin, for the tech support. Uh, thank you for everybody for showing up and um, Melissa for promoting and hosting. And um, and I have to say, by the way, my boss at uh, Bloomberg, I have the best boss in the world, by the way. So he's, he's fantastic. His name's Fahd Arshad. And so uh, just to say, it's, it's not his, his doings that I was difficult to get. <laughs> All right. Um, so yes, I'm, I'm talking about efficiency in UX research. I hope that there's something here for everybody. Uh, some of it may be old hat to some of the audience and for which I apologize, but um, this, let's just see if I can make this slide change. Oh, that's the first interesting thing is the arrow button doesn't work. Okay, I just wanna say a little uh, disclaimer here. So the opinions here are my own. They don't represent any previous employer or current employer. Um, it's a topic that's very close to my heart. I actually have sort of like been, this has been a passion for a while. Ted was like, don't you think it's a bit tooting your own horn to say that you're an efficient researcher? And yeah, yeah I guess, but you'll see why it's kind of become like a really um, sort of sore spot. Um, but I'll, I won't steal my own thunder. I'll get to that. So uh, yes, what I'm going to be talking about is UX research. So what do I mean by UX research? So um, well, uh, I was there back in the day. I was at Apple. I joined in about 1994. And uh, I actually was there before uh, Don Norman joined Apple. Actually, he arrived in 1995. And he's actually credited with the term UX. Now, that's really weird to me because I was in a group called User Experience Research, where I was the only user experience researcher. We had two designers. We had a couple of engineers. And Dan Russell was the manager. So go figure because somebody came up with that term before 1995. Um, also UX research, well, that was something that they were doing sort of uh, as designers in the human interface group, which was led by Joyne Mountford at the time. So the designers would go out, gather requirements and understand the context of uh, the, whatever they were building. There were, as far as I know, I may be wrong about this, but there were no full-time UX researchers. So I might have been the first full-time UX researcher that Apple ever hired. A weird, rare thing. Um, there were other people in the Bay sort of doing this kind of thing. And around that time, I know for sure IDO was also starting to hire UX researchers as well. And, uh, you know, they did a great job about promoting it. So, you know, Tom Kelly has a number of books out there. And you can see there on the left, the anthropologist is the first person in line who has a title in all of these faces of innovation, right? These they were really promoting and sort of saying, you know, you really need to go out there and understand customers. And, you know, UX research is just a continuation. I mean, people were doing research in product development before that they were doing it in the army, you know, when they're doing it in air traffic control, all sorts of places. So I don't want to say like, you know, oh, we just invented this thing. I mean, this, it has a long track record, it goes way back. So what do I mean by UX research? And, and by the way, so I just want to emphasize, it started in design organizations. So it seems to have had its birthplace at, you know, in Silicon Valley and Apple's sort of big group and it had it in IDO and then they spread it around. And so that's where it was. And it seems to still be mainly in design organizations. And so this is kind of like an issue for me because I kind of have gotten into trouble with that 
positioning. So I want to talk about what I mean by UX research. So, all right, so what do shoppers in stores do to be more efficient? What do people think exclusivity means? What do we do to motivate people? There's a bunch of questions here which are not exactly what you would call design questions. They're more like company delivering value to customers questions, right? And so uh, UX research or UX research can go way beyond design. I would say it's sort of like it's, it's outside of the purview of just design. And uh, this is one of my heroes, uh, Michael Porter, talking about uh, what is strategy. I don't know if you've ever read this paper. It came out in the Harvard Business Review in 1996. And it's one of the best papers I've ever written. It's really, really good, sort of very insightful about what companies need to do to be successful. And one of the quotes from that is, a company can outperform rivals only if it can establish a difference that it can preserve. And so certainly that difference could be the user experience as designed by designers, but it's a bunch of other stuff as well. There are all sorts of things that could be competitive advantages like better customer service or a better pricing deal, or you know, there are many other things that could go into delivering value to customers. So you know, research can actually concern itself with the look and feel, the interaction, the context. I mentioned that the people at IDEO and uh, the human interface group would look at the context in which products would be used for sure. But research can actually go further. It can sort of look out away from the product that you're thinking of building and just looking at that competitive landscape. Like what are all the things that are out there? And, you know, weird things that could be your competition. And Reed Hastings famously said at Netflix, well, I used to work, that sleep was Netflix's competition. <laughs> um, a little bit of a faux pas, but I mean, just, he was just trying to say, you know, you have to think outside the box of what your competition is. Like what you're trying to introduce a new product into an ecosystem of things that people could choose to do with their time or that solve their problems, right? And so research can go wider than that. And research can also even go like, there's no competition out there maybe that you can think of, but your company has a competency and so if the researcher sort of is a strategic thinker and thinks of what is this company good at doing that could do better than anybody else could do, I'm going to go out there and see if there's an opportunity, right? So what I'm trying to hammer home here is that research and design have an overlapping scope around what we traditionally call UX, but there are things that go on in design that are not necessarily to do with research, and then there are things that go on in research that are not necessarily to do with design. And I've run afoul of that because I've spent a lot of my time in that little left-hand area on the screen there, which has got me into trouble. And I'll explain that. So research is kind of like perception, you know, and I found this thing on Wikipedia. I was trying to look for something without a head, but, you know, that has eyes in the body. Uh, research is, could be like, you know, your, your sensory system and you have a haptic system where you know where the body is, you've got a sense of touch, you know what you're touching. And, and if you put research in design, it's kind of like putting research in the body because it's looking at what you're doing, the stuff that designers are designing or it looks at where you're standing, the stuff that you're designing just, you know, now we're gonna do this thing next because this, this is where we, we are now. But that means that you're kind of not looking where you're going, right? And I feel like research should be able to be talking higher up in the organization at a strategic level to the decision makers. Well, that's exactly because, yeah, there is a niche for that. It definitely needs to be a part of the design process. Unfortunately, Figma is there to eat that thing, you know, so. <laughs> yeah, everybody. Well, Samick used to have this problem where yeah. it made everything look like a button. And I think with Figma, you can get into this rut mm -hmm. of letting its affordances Yes. Direct your designing. And I love the way you put that actually. About, you know, that, that's what I was in yeah. danger that I could do with. Oh, yeah, it's that's right. right. It's There's also in between state. Like uh, that, like you have like a Figma, but like a, you take out the color, you take out some of the simplify the UI, remove like all the stuff. So actually, still like you have uh, the easy way to edit and change a piece because sketches are hard to edit. That's one thing as well as a, as a side effect. Like you get the feedback. And sometimes we want to change for the next session something because we want to test something quickly. Yeah, sketches are harder. I I think in I think in Figma you can probably like use like little component sketches to make up the yeah. bigger thing, and and I believe that was some of what was going on. You know, because we had so much content, and you know, so I think you can reuse 
things and distort them to make them bigger or whatever you know so yeah anyway uh i don't want to get too lost in figma and sketching but um let's move on so big point i want to make here is like Iterate, 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 iterate. We all know this, right? But if you're on a short cycle, then, you know, it doesn't really matter if it's not perfect, right? It's almost like if you have a longer cycle, the longer it is, the more you have to be perfect because you can't correct. Whereas if your cycle is really tight, then you can do a scrappy study. Yeah, it wasn't great. But the next time around, you know, we'll catch the thing that we missed this time. Somebody will tell us something that will make us, oh, we'll completely change it. You know, we can do, we can be so much more agile with that really tight cycle. So I want to talk about what I sort of started calling the flywheel when I started doing this, first of all. Um, and it, it happens in any design team. It's where you get momentum, like everybody starts to buy in. It's a little uh, uh, clunky when you start your first time you get together and start a process and it's awkward and you kind of have to persuade people. And, you know, it's not it just feels clunky, but then it starts to become a routine and then suddenly it starts. It feels like, oh, this is a routine now. We're just doing it. It's rolling, you know. And that's what happened when I was uh, lucky enough to uh, be at Netflix. So um, I actually wound up getting from request to report in one week. And people do that. Yeah, they go, <laughs> eyebrows go up, mouths go open. And it's like, no, actually, if you talk to a lot of uh, skilled consultants, like UX researcher consultants, they'd be like, yeah, of course, I have to do that. You know, it's nothing special. Um, and I'm not saying like I'm a genius because I can go super fast. It's because I focused on it and I just, you know, really focused on all of the tricks that could go fast. And if you were an, ex you're a consultant, you're going to do that too, because it's your, you don't have time to sit there and like, you know, pontificate. You need to get that project done so that, you know, you've got some income coming in. Right. So I think uh, people who work in companies maybe don't feel the pressure to go as quickly sometimes, but you can. And um, yeah, let me show you. So why did I get obsessed with this? So I just want to tell another little sad story about why I became obsessed with going so quickly. And this is why I think this issue is really personal to me and why, you know, unless I'm tooting my own horn, I guess, but let me say, listen to this story. So I was at Lyft and I was in the autonomous vehicle group, right? There wasn't very many researchers doing autonomous vehicle research. And, uh, but I was also like, you know, Lyft is a bit behind the curve here. We're not going to get this product out for quite a while. And I wonder, you know, maybe I could find a company that's more likely to have a product out in the near future. And I found this really, I'm not going to say who they are, but it's a really cool, like robot delivery um, service. And I was like, oh, great. So, you know, I applied, it's hugely competitive. There was like a hundred and people, they tell you how many people are applying. You're like, oh my God, 150 people. I got right to the end of the process. Not because I'm a genius, because there's almost nobody who could say, I have experience with autonomous vehicles. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that was a crucial advantage. But I got to the end of this pro interview process. And, and then I had this call with the HR person. They said, we're going to pass. I'm like, what? <laughs> well, the team felt that you were too rigorous and too scientific. Like, what? <laughs> and nobody had ever asked me during this interview process, can you be fast and scrappy? And they're like, we'd like somebody who's fast and scrappy. And I thought, what? <laughs> I was doing all of these studies in like short time, but Lyft had charged me with making sure that nobody had an accident. You yeah. can't do scrappy research on safety. I'm sorry, but it's just, <laughs> you had to have something that was super rigorous. And that was what I showed them. It was like, so, you know, you should be pleased to have somebody who knows to do, re like, if, if one of your things has an accident, you know, like, you'd be able to point and say, well, we did serious research, you know, we did the best we could. Not that we did a quick study in a week and we thought it was all right. We were just like this robot on the streets, you know, but no, no. So they didn't ask me, are you scrappy? Can you do scrappy stuff? And I was like, why? Is and then I started to get paranoid and I was like, great hair, great course. Mm -mm. Everybody there was 20 or 30. I was old enough to be their mother. And then I started getting paranoid. It's like, oh yeah, maybe they thought like I was doing all of this scientific stuff and I'm kind of older and maybe I'm set in my ways and they'd never be able to get me to stop doing this. You know, if I, if I could do scientific quality research then I could only do scientific quality research because you can't teach an old dog new tricks. I took objection to that. No, <laughs> I'm going to like show those people. That is why I became obsessed with this idea of being scrappy because I really felt like, gosh, you know, maybe that's what people think is that as you get older, you start slowing down. 
And so it became a paranoia. That is why I say, you know, I'm proud to be able to say, I can still do it. I can still go quickly. Please, please, please don't judge me with the gray hairs. So, all right. At Netflix, I had this really great opportunity to do this really super fast paced stuff. We did this zero to one project called Tudum. And it's supposed to be Tudum. In case you're wondering why it has such a weird name. Is that too dumb? <laughs> That's what people said initially. So anyway, it's to do. And uh, what we wanted to do was to create like a site that would like really uh, be there for fans when the season ends, right? Some place where you could go and like just revel in like all the gossip about like the next season or like the bios and the backgrounds of the actors and all that sort of stuff. Or go behind the scenes and find out what's going on. So it's supposed to be full of all of this interesting content. And I don't want to go into the, that because I just want to talk about the process behind it because this was where this whole flywheel thing started to happen. So this is where we got to this, you know, from Monday to Friday, that's our cycle. We're going to do like research every week. And so how did that work? So again, it was clunky. This didn't just happen overnight and it didn't depend on the fact that this was a team of people who had great relationships with each other, really trusted each other. They had in a culture where, you know, we're all like, we're all pulling together. There's no like, you know, your gain is my loss or any of that stuff going on there. Netflix is a great culture, by the way, really good culture. Um, so we would uh, start by harvesting research questions. I would actually, you know, that template document that I had there, that could be a place just to dump questions or we could have a spreadsheet. I think the designers kept a spreadsheet where they would put their, questions um but they would be coming in from other places too like branding or i forget other places anyway it wasn't just design because research goes beyond design um and then uh we would you know have those available so then on these mondays we would have this weekly meeting and we would present the previous research from the week before and then we would plan the next one because so we'd like we look at the questions what's the highest priority here okay we're going to do this this is this we all agree so then, um, and then I have to say, oh, by the way, I didn't give credit where it was due. I have to say, uh, Danielle Gutman was the researcher who actually, she was my contractor on this thing because I was actually working on multiple different projects. So she was the one that actually did the research. I was supporting her. Um, let's see, there's, uh, oh gosh, there's so, I mean, so many people. I just I have to say that, uh, you know, I couldn't have done it with this amazing team. Uh, Kevin O'Connor was the designer. Um, yeah, he was uh, really great to work with. So anyway, that said, uh, so this amazing team, so we would all agree on what the questions were and then have this, um, you know, contract at the end, like, right, okay, we're going to like produce this uh, document. So Danielle would then very quickly write a plan. Here's what we've agreed we're going to do. Here's how we're going to do it. So she would write the plan and the discussion guide, and then everybody would give feedback on that. And then, um, we would be uh, socializing it around the team. So anybody who felt like they had a stake in this would get a say in this. And then uh, we finalized the plan and uh, develop the assets. So this is where me like picking up Figma skills was really handy because I didn't have to sit around. The designers were really busy too. And they found just like, make that text a bit bigger. Can you, can you put that just that widget in there? I eventually just like, no, no, no I have to do this myself because it just was a bottleneck. And so I got rid of the bottleneck and it really helped speed things up. And then we would be recruiting uh, and running participants. So recruiting participants actually with user testing, you can actually do it on the same day. I mean, it literally takes like a few hours to get your schedule completely full up. Uh, and then we would run the, the participants maybe on the Thursday. By the end of the day, we've got everything. And then Danielle would be able to write up a really nice succinct report and have it ready for Monday. She'd be done by Friday. And I tried to do that. I tried to always read, you know, like I get to the end, I literally start writing up my report on the day, the last interviews, don't leave it because you start to forget. And so, uh, and I do try to keep it to no more than a day of uh, writing up. And so when I left Netflix and I went to DoorDash, DoorDash I, we're nearly done. Okay. We're nearly done. This is like the last few slides. I was able to actually do that on my own. So, and I had to get friendly with Snowflake and, SQL and pulling bit my own to still could do it on my own. And so, you know, and I'm saying this is anybody can do this. This is not rocket science. Okay. One last point, the next to last point. This matter, this really matters. You need to have great relationships. You need to build really fantastic relationships with people on your team. If you find that like people are resisting 
right? Not agreeing with you, pushing back, right? It's not because there's something wrong with the research necessarily. It's because that you don't understand what their position is. Like you don't, they don't trust you. You're trying to convince them. No, no, I'd talk to people. You have to have a great relationship. So sometimes if it's, you're mystified why it is that people just won't listen to the research or why they need to do research, it might be that you need to build those relationships up so that people actually will, you know, like accept you as a member of the team who is trustworthy and, and pulling in the same direction as them, not there to criticize the designs or something like that. Um, and then caveats. Obviously, if you're doing safety research, health kind of those kinds of research, this stuff doesn't apply. There, you need to do that stuff right. I'm talking about the just good enough stuff for most product design, right? And then the other thing is that researchers are not fungible commodities. There are very different kinds of researchers. You have, you know, wise old owls. Hopefully I'm a wise old owl. I like to think I'm wise. I'm definitely old. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, there's like the weird ones who are doing eye tracking and interaction analysis and conjoint survey design and all that sort of stuff, right? They are specialists. This doesn't necessarily apply in any of those kind of places either. And then also research vary, like in, in experience. So like very beginner research will probably not be able to do the weekly cycle and shouldn't be put under pressure and made to feel bad because they can't. You know, that's just not fair. So just bear that in mind where research is very different. So anyway, um, so hopefully if you're interested in generalist kind of research, then this was good for you. And if not, hopefully there was something there for you anyway. So I'm done. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> that was, uh, a very Sorry, I went on a bit. Yeah. And uh, when I when I when I was thinking about, I'll just tell an anecdote and want your opinion about. It. I, I was running a study where we were checking. We wanted to check voting for people with reading disabilities, and so we recruited very carefully with a survey. Had a third party get the people because you know that these are you know people in their protected. Uh, protected uh, class, you know, and 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 um, and you know, with our IRB, uh, which I didn't hear you say once, by the way. Um, uh, and, uh, yeah, yeah, I actually was a chair of an IRB once, so don't get me started. Well, I'm just, uh, don't get. I've done all the training. Yeah, don't get me started. Some work you can ask. Yeah. But anyway, what we found was the people that we recruited that had their documentation of having reading disabilities came through, we put half people that had reading disabilities and half that didn't. We paid everybody $50, and that was in New York City at a voting, we, we rented a real voting place. And what we found is that the people that were off the streets getting that $50, which is a lot of money for them, had more reading disability problems than the people who could document it because those people had gone through training. Mm -hmm. And we had a terrible, terrible time getting any uh, any uh, normal people in our in our cohort of a hundred people. So there's this this sampling thing that she glossed over just jumped out at me with that story because it's so easy to think you're getting one cohort mm -hmm. and not get them at all. Oh yeah. And you have to figure out how am I testing who I did get. And what what we did is we actually had an IQ test in the middle of the voting experience, which saved our ass. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because there were people in that cohort that were had the IQs under 70. Yeah. And, you know, it just, it changes everything. Yeah, and then I didn't talk about accessibility research, which is a whole different ball of wax, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, you know. Yeah, there's so, I've glossed over so much here. You know, I could have spoken all night and I probably we, wouldn't be done. We, will, right? we, will, we, want <laughs> we want you to speak all night. And anybody have a question for her? Hey, just a moment, I'm going to give you this microphone and hopefully it's going to work. Uh, I have actually two questions. Uh, one is about uh, uh, what do you think about uh, panels versus always fresh users? Like, uh, for example, you have a, a panel that repeat every week or every month. So, what, what versus panel, panel panels? Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, it's a swings and roundabouts thing, right? Sometimes panels are very convenient. And, um, you know, if it's you're, if you're having troubles recruiting, I mean, it's like for Netflix, we didn't need to have a panel because it's very easy to recruit Netflix watchers. Um, and so, and it wasn't, you know, like if we didn't quite get like a super representative sample, it wasn't the end of the day for design. And a lot of the things it doesn't, you know, you wouldn't expect there to be a big difference. I mean, you know, you could, uh, Say if you want to, for example, get a panel of people, and there are actually accessibility companies who do have panels, for example, because you have to have, there's so many different 
disability you can't just lump everybody with vision problems into like there's totally different kinds of vision problems yeah. there's a bit people who read with screen readers and then there's the people who leave massive amounts of magnification yeah. right and then there's other kinds of visual problems like peripheral or uh, central vision loss you know so even just within vision there's just like a massive range of different kinds of things you have to think about so that's a place where you obviously like it's better to have a panel and usually a company that provides accessibility research will have their own panel of people that they work with who, who do that. And, you know, and that's just because recruiting the right people is just really, really hard. Yeah. And in other situations, like there's no need. It doesn't, yeah, you know, probably we're not catching every corner case, every edge case, but for the amount of time it would take us to recruit exactly the right people, again, it's that 80% of the way there is good enough, you know. And yeah, we may miss out some special you know snowflakes whose needs are not quite being met but uh in the interest of moving quickly and just getting good products out quickly it's just sometimes we question. won't have those hard to recruit people yeah yeah i was amazed when you said when you went to the flight of being able to go from return request to report in just five business days yeah uh, you I, could do it in less actually in your name and my name is Lucas. yeah uh yes um i've only heard that in context of um graphic research or rolling research programs and to me it seems like a big part of that was to speed up the data analysis mm -hmm. um, and how do you train these stakeholders to take notes and also get them engaged in becoming more other things self-interest they want the results yesterday and i tell them if you want the results yesterday then this is how we're going to do it because it will you'll get your report in hours instead of days. And then, that, okay, <laughs> I'll take notes. <laughs> yeah. And how did you, what, what's, the, what's the training look like for them to take notes? You said um, verbatim? Yeah, I mean, some of it was a bit of trial and error. I would realize like there are things that have evolved over time that uh, we would learn together. Because um, I used to do it myself. I literally used to talk to people to type at the same time. And I'm not a touch typist. So that was kind of funny because I'd be like, question, typing, typing, typing. Um, uh, but th these people, it would just be like, they would not be so good at first. And then they would get better and better and better. And it was just because I didn't have time to sort of like, they're product managers or, you know, designers. They're really busy trying to get time on their schedule to do a training. It's just hard so i would wrote out like here's the instructions try to do these things do do not paraphrase do not synopsize do not say what the implications are that's my job right you know um stick with the question like i will mark but i will put my i will select the column i'm in so you can see and then i will sometimes call out to them we're in column bi we just skipped that one because they mentioned that earlier so yeah it's trial and error. Another question from uh, edwin uh okay and just Following up in my head from our, from our quick exchange earlier, uh, my question is really, you're taking the notes, you're not interpreting, when does the interpretation happen? So that's my job because I'm looking at the big picture. I'm looking at what like multiple people said instead of latching onto what just one person said. And then, I mean, that happens in here, right? This is all of the inferences and connections that you're making, which you have to back up, you know, I have to mm -hmm. say, this is what they seem to be saying, and here's the quotes that back it up. Maybe you'll disagree with me or not, but you know, I try to sort of always, my research heavily indexes the notes directly. So you can, if you don't agree with my summary, go look at the notes and see what you think. Couple quick questions. Um, first of all, um, you know, um, you talk about the books. I mean, obviously, you know, I don't like making surveys that are more than you know, five or six questions for certain kinds of things. Um, Experimental design seems like super important. And you know, you, you've got in your bones from 30 years of doing this. I have a degree in it. Yeah. 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 So the question is for, for people that are getting started, where do you, you know, I know that people took some classes and everything, but do you have any, you know, just simple, simple things to say to people that are getting started about experimental design? Confounds. That's like, you know, sums it up in one word, like, you know, there are so many things that can distort your results. So the art of doing a good experiment is to isolate so that there's no other possible explanation for what you're seeing. And, you know, that, I mean, it does, it's, you take degrees in this stuff. I can't just summarize it in short order. Um, 
So, you know, like you have order effects, you have, um, you know, like explaining things to participants properly, making sure that everybody gets exactly the same treatment, things like that. Um, being in a situation where like, so like, if you were doing it remotely, for example, you know, how do you know that like two participants are actually like looking at the same screen even, things like that, you know? So it's like very, very hard to get, you just have to kind of think about all of the possible ways in which there could be alternative explanations for the effect you're getting well, I, and then just I, I, isolate the, you know. But I, I go back to something you said earlier, which is try it on one person, right? If, you know, when, when, when you try it on yourself, yeah, if you can turn your objectivity yeah. your way up, you can find lots of mistakes. And we Actually, you know, I didn't so, mention yeah. that. Yeah. Every study we do, we we do dry runs. We definitely, because that even in like scrappy research, you kind of find, oh, this didn't work really, did it? No, we'll have to change it. I think it's completely correct. Yeah. Um, Delmer, you had a question. Yeah, I have, my name is Delmer. I have one more question. Like uh, about uh, if you ever tried synthetic users, like uh, like uh, we did some experiments in terms of like actually like uh, we identified behavior segments. Yeah. Uh, after some research, of course, and uh, and then we fed those behavior segments, like in, in creating those synthetic users, and uh, of course, we didn't want to replace research, mm -hmm. like in, the, in that first search, but it was very good for this quick iteration first cycle. Yeah. Did you have a chance playing? I that? have not done that. No, I have not done that. And I mean, oh, Tom, do you want to say a little bit more? About yeah, you, yeah, you use your chat. Sure. Like <laughs> so. So. Uh, um, I mean, some give a good anecdote. Yeah, yeah. It's it, pretty it much like, work terribly, but it work well. Yeah, so pretty much like we have a situation where, like, uh, very often we do like design sprints, right? And design sprints, like, uh, several days in a row, and uh, you want to you have some ideas, it wants to quickly test. Yeah. Uh, get to like it's like is this like stupid or what I'm not asking here or yeah, like, yeah. Uh, and uh, and uh, we could just input that idea to uh, this kind of uh, mm -hmm. it, most of these guys was just like text based in that particular phase where you were yeah uh and um, hey what about this idea that we were doing this and that and, and other things and uh and uh, tell me what uh, is a pro and a con for you uh of course there's like a preparation for the touch user in terms of creating like hey you're now this person with this particular profile right and then the replies were pretty interesting and uh and uh, we thought it would be standardized but they're not like they're actually responding with different insights about different concepts that uh, enabled us to to quickly like oh let's actually close this gap here didn't think about mm -hmm. let's like uh, do something else that uh, makes this more rounded yeah uh, and then after that particular iteration we took to real people yeah what was the platform you were using we we use a uh, chat GPT actually like uh, because uh, there's a way that you can say like hey now you're this person and we put uh, the profile or the behavior profile. And uh, there's some kind of other variables so that you just have to clean up. Uh, you have like a pro account, and there's this, there are like a, um, there's a, I yeah. don't know, you know, I haven't used it that much. I know that like when you go in, there's like a whole bunch of things on the side that you can choose from. I'm just wondering like, where, where is the option people should look Yeah, for? we actually worked with a developer to create a quick prototype to use the APIs yeah. uh, with a pro account. So that yeah. way you could uh, you could set up like uh, all this kind of part of the of the behavior right. uh, profile as a pull down, yeah, yeah. instead of having to type everything every time. Yeah, and there's a bunch of uh, YouTube videos about all of this stuff. If anybody wants to know, like you can just YouTube like how to do synthetic users. I'm sure there's plenty of videos on. I know there's, there's and there's also people like creating like new little tools. There's also like new businesses springing up that are also yeah. like trying to bring this to market as a product. And so, depending on how much developer time you can get like you can do it yourself like yeah what's well, was a uh, hack like we're looking actually in three days the whole yeah. thing yeah. So, yeah another thing i heard you say belmer was you talked about you asked a question about pal panels and i just want to make a comment and then i'm sure victoria has a lot to say about that the history of focus groups is that there's become somebody that's that's that takes so, power right. and takes over and 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 moves the whole group and it's very hard to get consistent or or objective results from those yeah. kinds of from panels do do i mean you want to tell me i'm wrong um i have done that very very infrequently and interestingly i did it uh, to group interviews in japan with japanese teenagers 
and uh, the the problem the, <laughs> the opposite problem was getting anybody to say anything at all. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it just depends. You know, yeah. like some kinds of people are definitely there'll be somebody like that, and then in other situations. But it's back to the cohort question. I mean, yeah. those, those yeah. Japanese kids have a very different. <laughs> and by the way, they act differently depending on who's oh, in yeah. the room. Yeah. And I mean, I, I you know I've had trouble with these Japanese kids where get the adults out of the room quickly. And 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 forever. Well, we what we ended up was getting out of the room. Exactly. We went and actually started interviewing them in cafes, and it worked much better. Yeah. Uh, we were in a giant big room with like you know a half silvered mirror, and then there was like note takers and interpreters. Yeah, help us. Yeah. So intimidating, and they were going beetroot colored. They were so stressed. Yeah. yeah. So I um I want to make sure that we don't go on all night, but um because you know we're all a bunch of HCI professionals. Okay. These questions you guys are asking are are actually based on so much interesting experiences. That's why I wanted you to go into your little bit of detail. Um, so, Victoria, do you have any questions that you want to ask? Uh, you know, do you want to use us in some sense as a as a as a, as a sounding board for anything? Or well, feedback really is like, it, was there any value in? You know, I was thinking of writing this as an article. Actually, this originally the idea started as an article. And um, and so somebody suggested, like, do it as a presentation. So I was saying you should write an article. Yeah, it's written. So, um, <laughs> oh, that was okay. All I said was it, she should write. Go, go, go. Okay. Yeah, I just don't know, you know, because it's very hard to know if what you know is something that everybody knows, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, so that was my big question was like, how much of this felt like it was just, oh, yeah, it's just preaching to the choir. Or whether there was uh, stuff that was sort of value add there. Yes. I, I mean, we all know like uh, COVID changed a lot in research, right? In terms of like uh, uh, before it was so much about like uh, being in person and uh, focus groups, panels, those kind of stuff, and and COVID blocked that for a long time. Uh, what are the positive things from COVID that uh, will stay forever? You know what? The funny thing is that I was doing everything remotely before COVID. Um, I, 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 I guess because I was a, such an early adopter of things like Google Drive and delegating a lot to students. Uh, before this started, I was just talking about time apart, where I was, uh, I developed an approach which was where I would hire a whole bunch of students and then. As this, and I would do more projects as I was consulting, and then this, this more experienced students would supervise the junior students, and I could just like do research at scale really quickly with a whole ton of students, and it was all being done remotely. Um, and so in my case, I kind of just kind of got used to doing things over video, and then when I left um, Park and started at Lyft, I think I did every yeah every single interview that I did there with customers, not the safety drivers, with everything with the customers was over video link. And then, so obviously the drivers in the cars, I was in the cars with the drivers. That was so much fun, by the way, doing fault injection studies. But um, yeah, so I didn't really feel the difference after COVID. I can't really comment. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say that during COVID, I started doing a lot of things online and very quickly I got to this to this momentum thing with with I had a student in Paris actually, and we did experiments in in days uh, that would that blew my mind because they because I you know I was used to the setup and, takes time uh, you know yeah and, setting and, these things up takes your time takes all bringing people in yeah and it kind of started with mechanical turf as people getting lots of people together and then Craigslist bringing in people but I think that we're now at a point where there are lots of ways of finding. Um, finding validated um, subjects and one of the most dangerous ways is the professional subject. Yeah, yeah. You were going to ask a question? I mean, uh, no, the flip side, what was lost? Like, uh, I have a little anecdote for us to introduce. Like, uh, I remember when uh, my ideal times, like, uh, we used to go to houses of people, right? And it's like, hey, um, what about, for example, your eating behaviors? Like, and they was like, no, I really I eat really healthy. I love a healthy food. And then, and then after a few minutes, like, we're like, okay, can you walk around the house? And and then it starts to, oh, do you mind if I open your fridge? Sure. And then you open the fridge and you see like a, a bunch of a bunch of junk food, right? So is that what we mentioned earlier, like what they say versus what they do, right? The difference of that, like. Uh, 
And I, how, I how actually did... have a real parallel virtual story. So I well, was how do I say that in a video call, right? I was at DoorDash, and I was the first person to do a study of naturally occurring eating. <laughs> um, so, like, what do people? Because we were doing a lunch plan, and we kind of wanted to know what do people eat for lunch. And we, don't know, we don't know what do people like to eat for lunch. So, well, I'll do a study. So, I actually asked people to describe. I interviewed people about what they did for lunch. And like how they like to eat, you know, what was driving their eating. Oh, I like to try to eat healthy. Blah, blah, blah. And then I would show them a big menu and I'd say, if you pick something now for lunch, what would you choose? <laughs> I'll go for the, uh, like the beef, like, you know, like deep fried. It was just like, <laughs> <laughs> they would like always skew towards the, you know, the self gratification thing. Now, the, what was really interesting. So this was a, a parallel thing where I was trying to like see if like what they said and what they did was different. And it showed even over video, I was able to get that thing. Um, so yeah, it's kind of interesting because like, I think you're right. Like, so like us trusting what people tell you can be a real problem. And I was lucky that I was able to sort of catch that with a mechanism yeah. where I was actually saying, you know, pick something for lunch now. And and also what was really interesting that came out of that study was understanding like the difference between why when people shop for food for the week, they're actually doing this kind of like um, uh, thinking of the future, which is governed more like the frontal lobes. It's kind of like what I aspire to eat healthy food. So they would buy healthy stuff from the supermarket, fill their fridge with more healthy stuff. But on the day, if they were ordering for now, then it's like the burger. It's the, like the, because that's now the present self bias, which is like I'm gonna forget about the future and just gratify now. Mm -hmm. So that people, if it meant that it was kind of in a weird position because the lunch plan was supposed to be like what people would eat for lunch <laughs> every day, and if you want to put stuff up there that people really want to buy and not go to the competition, then you should put up the unhealthy stuff because that's what people will impulse buy. But really, what people want to eat. And what you really, you know, if you're like supporting their health, you should be putting the healthy options there. So what I, I ended up recommending was kind of like giving people stuff that was healthy, but had something like yummy on it, you know, that would be like, this will gratify, but also like it's got the greens, it's got the healthy stuff in there. I mean, I, I don't remember whether they would actually follow up, but I just thought it was really interesting just thinking about this. You know, I love human biases and I love when I get to do research where I actually get to sort of expose that stuff and say, look what's here. You know, like they say one thing and then they do something else. Right. Yeah. And then maybe maybe we can even design ways of ordering, which bring out the planning instead of the gratification. Yeah. But in any case, we are getting a little late and there's a few people actually starting to drop off the the, the, the thing. And Thank I, you. And I think audience. that it's um, a wonderful conversation. And um, after we turn off the mics and everything, we can stay for a few minutes. I could even walk people through the building a little bit and give them a feeling of what this place is. Maybe Pete could. But probably it's going to be time to get home because some of us yeah. are going to have to get up in the morning. We too. do. We so do. thank you, thank you, thank, thank you, you, Victoria. Thank you. Fabulous talk. Great to see you. Your, all of your cheerfulness and, and thank you and, for inviting and, me. Yeah, well, and, and sharing all of this and putting this time and effort in. So thank you very much.